So I want to talk about declarative thinking, declarative practice. Uh, my name's Kevlin Henney, um, which is sufficiently internet unique. It's quite easy to find, quite easy to get wrong as well. Um, uh, let me think, things that are relevant. Um, I've uh, been heavily into patterns, software architecture, all this kind of stuff, very much into the code. Um, uh, edited uh, this book a few years back. Um, but it seems these days I seem to be better known, and this makes sense of the uh, slide that Jens put up yesterday <coughs> yesterday morning, I seem to be better known um, as a brand for failure, which I'm not entirely sure how I feel about. Uh, I was asked this the other week, how, how, how does it feel to be identified with uh, software failure? Because um, uh, I, from many years ago, I, I started collecting um, photos and screenshots of um, uh, software and system failures in public places. And thanks to the joy of Twitter, people send me more and I retweet them. Um, and then last year, uh, 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 somebody actually turned me into a word. Um, I saw a Kevlin Henney screen, and uh, I've noticed that, uh, oh yeah, that's a Kevlin Henney. Um, so, uh, so yeah, this seems to be happening. Uh, but it got to a really good point. About a year ago, um, there was a conference, uh, Agile in the City, in, uh, in Bristol, where I live in the UK, um, and the conference organizer came up to me, uh, uh, John Clapham, and said, Kevlin, there's a Kevlin Henney screen downstairs. I need to take a photograph of you standing in front of it <laughs> so that you can... <laughs> so I can tweet it and then you can retweet it. And then this year, because the conference was last week, we did this again. So we got this kind of <laughs> Kevlinception thing going. Um, now, I will talk a little bit later about uh, this. Uh, part of my motivation in this is, is testing. Um, uh, but the main goal of my talk here is not um, uh, testing, although that will be used as an example later. Um, uh, it is about the idea that we often focus on language features. And uh, many years ago, I was uh, a columnist for C++ Report and then C++, uh, C++ Users Journal uh, and so on, and a number of other magazines. Magazines, aren't they great? Paper, who remembers that? Um, so. The thing is that the column that I had in C++ Report and CUJ was entitled From Mechanism to Method. Because at that point, my, I'd, I'd started noticing people were always, myself included, focusing on language features, focusing on cool bits of technical stuff. And that's great up to a point. But you end up with people wandering around going, hey, I've got a language feature. Where do I use it? Which is kind of the wrong question. Okay, it's that classic, you know, I've got a hammer question, you know. Whose thumb can I hit? That is always the question people are asking, they just don't know it. Or this screw, can I use this hammer on it? No, it's the wrong way around. What are you trying to build? I'm trying to build IKEA furniture. Okay, if you're trying to build IKEA furniture, a hammer is probably the wrong thing. Let's actually solve the real problem here. So I was focused on this idea of moving from the idea of the mechanism out to the method, why are we doing this? What is it you're trying to actually do? And in many cases, it's, a, it's ultimately a quest that is familiar to many people in life. It's a quest for meaning. What, are we, what does this mean? In fact, that is actually the biggest challenge when you come to a code base. What does this mean? Okay? It's because, like, yeah, I can <laughs> when somebody helpfully explains to you that this argument is passed to that, you can go, yeah, yeah, I can see that. But what does it mean? Oh, it's calling this. Yes, I can see that, but what does it mean? That's, that's the greatest challenge that we have in a code base. And a code base should be a system of meaning. So what I'm interested in here is this idea of being able to be more intentional, to communicate your intention. And there's a lot of guidelines about naming and so on. I'm not going to touch, mostly I'm not going to touch on those. I will touch on those briefly a little bit later. But one side of that very large story is this idea of a declarative approach. And declarative approaches are contrasted with imperative approaches. An imperative approach is all about state change. It's about modifying stuff. A subset of declarative approaches is functional programming. They're not directly equivalent. One is a superset of the other. And so declarative, um, uh, declarative programming contains functional programming, just as imperative programming contains procedural programming. 
Um, but let's not get distracted by the idea that it's to do with declarations. That's not really what it is. Um, there are perfectly good sessions on um, uh, type systems and all the rest of it, and type systems do inform or can inform a declarative approach, but they are not um, necessary, and that's not the whole story. Uh, so how long have we been obsessed with this idea of declarative approaches? Well, for a very, very, very long time. And I love this quote from... Uh, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, computer science in the 1960s to 80s spent a, uh, a lot of effort making languages which were as powerful as possible. He wrote this in the early 90s. It's still true. We are obsessed with making things more powerful. Um, much as, you know, I love, I really like languages that give me more power. I, I, I'm, I'm always, fat, but there's a little part of me that goes, no, you don't want this. Yeah? Or rather, there's a bit of me that says you don't need this. My wife is always emphasizing to me that there is a difference between want and need. She's been working at this for nearly 30 years. I think I may have just understood, but I'm not sure. I want power, raw power. Give me the iron throne of C++. Yeah, get me close to the metal. Yeah, but at the same time, I like a lot of other languages and... Sometimes they don't give you that power and they're just fine. In fact, some of them are, are massively minimal. Nowadays, we have to appreciate the reasons for picking not the most powerful solution, but the least powerful. The reason for this is the less powerful the language, the more you can do with the data share, uh, stored in that language. If you can write it in a simple declarative form, anyone can write a program and analyze it in many ways. The problem that we have is the subtlety of state change and the subtlety of do this, do that. And it's all about the do this and do that. And you change one small assumption, one small tweak, and suddenly it's gone. It's a lot for a human to understand, but it can also be quite surprising um, in terms of its results. It's very brittle. It requires a great deal of intellectual effort in the worst cases. Clearly, declarative programming is not a new idea. Um, it's also not an obscure idea at all. Um, it's, uh, as the uh, sink of all human knowledge, Wikipedia observes, the make file language is similar to declarative programming. This class of language in which necessary end conditions are described, but the order uh, in which actions are to be taken is not important is something uh, sometimes confusing to programmers used to imperative programming. Actually, there's a bit more to declarative programming than is suggested there, and it's not always about the end conditions. Um, sometimes what you're doing is you're describing relationships. And um, the minute you are able to even so much as declare an array, the world opens up in, the, in these terms. Uh, but it's about organizing relationships. So. What we're doing here is moving a little bit beyond uh, Niklas Wirth's um, uh, book on structured programming from the early 1970s. Um, I'm sure he must have really frustrated the publishers. Um, you know, algorithms plus data structures equals programs. This is a very unconventional title. I mean, these days we're expecting emoji to appear in titles, but this is like the early 70s and his, his his publishers must have gone, what, what are you doing? What are these symbols doing in the title? You know, so so um, anyway, I'm going to simplify it. I'm going to get rid of one. There you go. What we're looking at here is really the idea that data structures are programs. Okay? How much can I express through that? And the organization of data. I'm going to pick an example adapted um, from 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know. <coughs> There's uh, a piece by Burke Hafnagel. Um, it's uh, entitled, the title, there's two things about this article that are brilliant. One is the example he uses, and two is, uh, is the title and the advice. Put the mouse down a step away from the keyboard. Um, this is great. There's this uh, whole notion that sometimes you're problem solving, and you are busy problem solving, and you are problem solving more, and you're doing the same thing, but now harder and with more effort, and you're getting the same problem, just more of it. You're getting more frustrated. There's this whole idea that you cannot solve a problem at the level at which it was found. You need to do something different. So I normally offer this as a piece of advice, but I also offer other pieces of advice. The idea is if you are stuck in a situation, then do the opposite. If you are sitting down, stand up. Okay? If you've been drinking lots of coffee, if you've been mainlining caffeine, now's a good time for a herbal tea. If you're not a coffee drinker, now's a great time for a coffee. Yeah, B, do something different. If you've been listening to music, stop. If you haven't been, start. In other words, do something that changes the way that you are thinking or being. Now, Burke's example was um, uh, taken from Java, and I thought, actually, I'm going to rewrite 
the premise of his example. He didn't show the whole example. I thought, okay, using, um, using the style that he has done, I'm going to rewrite the example that he was dealing with um, when he decided to put the mouse down and step away from the keyboard. The example that he was dealing with, I thought I'd have a go at rewriting it in C++. <laughs> ah, people are paid to write this kind of stuff. Um, so what I love about this is that it turns out, a discovery I made at a client site a few years ago, it turns out that it's incredibly easy to write bad code. Yeah? Now, I, and I, I mean that in the sense that if you ask somebody to write bad code, they struggle. But, if you, but it turns out bad code is not arbitrary. All code, code that we consider bad, code that we consider good, comes from a system. And it turns out that you only have to say, I want you to do it in this style. I want you to do it in these ways. And before you, and I did it with, uh, with this client. I said, here's three assumptions. And I wasn't really sure how it was going to come out. But I was so surprised when the three assumptions that I made. And I said, now what we're going to do is we're going to do a network connection using your style. And suddenly, I recreated their architecture. It was coming out before me. Code that we consider poor is not arbitrary. It's systematic. So I followed the style Burke had in his article. And here, magnificently, we are trying to parse a time string, um, a 12-hour time string that has the meridian of AM or PM. Um, we could simplify this and turn to the one true clock, 24-hour time, but actually, that only gets rid of a couple of lines. So this classifies whether or not a string is formatted to give a valid time. Uh, it's a small mart. It's not, it's not the biggest code you're ever going to find. It's not probably not the worst. I wish it was the worst. But in its own little way, it's its own masterpiece. So Burke kind of put the mouse down, stepped away from the keyboard, came back. Let's reframe it. Here we go. Now, sometimes people joke, aha, regular expressions. I had a problem. I solved it with regular expressions. Now I have two problems. Um, <laughs> or I have star problems. <laughs> now, funny as that is, the thing is, I can explain this to my kids. And I, I want to point out, that's a teenager and a teenager. They have a fixed budget of attention. OK, they're like, you know, it's, it's, it's like you turn the clock and the sand start running through. OK? And to explain this, to, this, this is the thing about declarative approaches. It turns out the declarative approaches are very easy to explain. They are easily talked through. You know, this shows you know a couple of things, but perhaps not the right things. But to explain this and walk through this is just insane. I can explain this to somebody who is relatively non-technical and has a short attention span very, very easily. So one of the goals here in terms of trying to uh, take this is not simply commoditizing and wrapping code up. It's actually changing the way of thinking, finding a model of description that changes the signal to noise ratio. Okay, and, and that's what we find in legacy code. Um, you know, we get a, a lot of uh, irrelevant data and a lot of noise in this code. So can we do this kind of, can we do other things in C++ that are of a declarative nature? Well, pretty much most functional programming falls into this. And the, um, the, the source of all functional wisdom is the, uh, if you believe them, is Haskell. Um, of course they say that. Um, but there's actually quite a good definition. Uh, many programming languages support programming in both functional and imperative styles. So I've done a number of talks on uh, functional programming in C++ and in other languages that are, do not have um, a functional core and do not have a functional history. Um, each one feels slightly different. They have different strengths, different weaknesses, different areas of support. Um, both functional and imperative style, but the syntax and facilities of a language are typically optimized for only one of these styles. And social factors like coding conventions and libraries often force the programmer towards one of those styles. And that's quite an important consideration. It's almost irrelevant what a language supports. It's what the culture supports. It's what the people around it are prepared to support. It is quite interesting, um, having seen languages evolve over many years, seeing which communities grasp the new features and actually change what they consider to be their core style and which do not. I was actually fascinated um, in the 1990s when somebody told me that COBOL was going to get objects. And it's just like, yeah, nobody will notice. The culture will not care. 
That is not a culture that is actually, you know, that's not a culture that is asking for revolution and evolution. You know, they're, they're, that, that's not the culture that's going to embrace it. Um, the problem is that when we have languages with this kind of spread, we have the problem of legacy uh, and so on. So let's take something that is brutally imperative. I almost use a go-to, but I don't know, I couldn't bring myself to do it. But I've, I've, got a, I've got a fairly crappy while loop here. So a problem that I've used for a number of years, very, very, very kind of simple toy problem. Let's, let's, let's generate, let's, let's sort of show the degree of um, imperative uh, thinking or you know, sort of very classical imperative thinking that's going on here. Now, I've commoditized, I've, I've switched out all the namespaces and everything. You'll see why later uh, in this particular example. Um, but what I've got here is the mechanics. What have I got? I've got an accumulation of state. I've got squares. This is where I'm going to hold my, the squares of the first 100 numbers, OK? So 1 through 100 inclusive, or 1 through 101 exclusive. Um, I'm going to set up a, a counter variable, OK? And then I am going to have a condition. Condition has no side effects, glorious. Um, then I'm going to push to the back of squares, then I'm going to change some states. So I've got two state changes in the loop. I've had to establish two things. Now, with a lot of experience, which everybody in this room has, you kind of see what's going on. But I'm just kind of looking at the number of lines there and what's really going on. You, you get so used to seeing it, you don't realize how broken this kind of thinking is. And you think, oh, Kevin's obviously missed the for loop. No, Kevin has not missed the for loop. <sighs> What does the for loop do? Oh, the for loop is one of those crappy statements, OK? I mean, I, some people think it's a great innovation. No, it's not. An innovation is the kind of, it's a for each loop, OK? This prevented languages evolving for years. You know, is, okay, C put this in, and it was just like, everybody said, oh, this is great. No, it isn't. I mean, it, it jumped from language like a bad, it, like bad disease, hopping from gene pool to gene pool, preventing people from saying, you know, why do we actually loop? Yeah, just putting the mechanics on one line. I mean, it's kind of nice. I mean, it brings things together. Yeah, some things are easier to see, but really, that's just a rearrangement of that. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, and it has some modest effect, and that's great. But it's exactly as procedural and imperative as the previous example. Okay, so I'm going to borrow from Eric Niebler's uh, um, ranges proposal. Uh, this is why, <laughs> and this is why I'm doing all the using namespaces. Uh, we have to give up this namespace obsession because otherwise you just end up with code. And all I see when I look at so much C++, there are reasons we do some things, but such orthodoxy. I see colons everywhere. There's just dots in front of my eyes. Okay, um, and when you start digging down into these namespaces, it's just oh, this is insane. So I, I wanted to present this in a way that made it look fair against other languages. Um, so. OK, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, oh, I've now got, what I've now done is I've actually effectively reduced the amount of state that I, the programmer, control. The for loop has become a properly declarative construct. In other words, yeah, there's stuff going on. We recognize the state change, but it's not our problem. I is bound. I is a parameter of the loop. If you reason about it like that, this makes a lot more sense. There is the range. It is declared. It's not the mechanics. It's not a question of, oh, OK, you start here, and I'm going to initialize something here, and then I'm going to set, and I'm going to manually write the condition. That is all taken away from you. We can do better than this. The next thing is we're going to take that. And now what we've got is a sensible relationship. What we've actually done here is we said, OK, I'm going to take the integers from 1 to 101 exclusive, and I'm going to transform them and square them. OK, oh. So that actually looks like what our goal is, which is to produce the squares of the first 100 numbers. The previous ones, there's no visible state change here that we care about. Of course, there's state change going on. But that's just mechanics. That's bookkeeping. It is not your job to do bookkeeping, OK? It's not your job to write loops. Has anybody, do you think you've written all the loops you ever need? I think I have. I don't think there's a single loop that I, I, I have to write in my life that will be different from any of the ones I've written before, to the point you've commoditized them in your brain. And we often talk about writing no raw loops, but let's really actually look at this from another point of view. Part of the reason for that, and also other cases, is the amount of state that we end up just managing, and that creates noise. It is more intentional. It, in fact, it is also more intentional. Yeah, English is great. Because these two words mean something different. 
okay? Now, sometimes people say, you know, English spelling, it's a mess, it's not logical. Oh, no, 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 they're wrong. There are about six or seven different kinds of logic in English spelling, and they are all simultaneous, okay? That's the problem. It's not that it lacks logic, it has far too many systems of logic, and this kind of intention is slightly different. What we're talking about here um, is a way of characterizing a set of things, or indeed we can apply it to a sequence. Um, blah, 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 a sense of an expression that determines its reference. So it's determination of a reference rather than ex uh, using an extension. So intention of prime numbers may be having non-trivial integral factors, whereas its extension would be 2, 3, 5, 7, keep on going. Okay, so an extensional approach is to make something explicit, and the intentional approach is to describe the rule that characterizes these. Uh, and what we find is that um, if I wanted the, a set of the squares of the first 100 numbers, um, and uh, I, I sort of uh, rendered it using uh, more mathematical notation, the set builder notation, then this comes out as being surprisingly familiar. Um, it turns out that uh, we've seen this before in code as well. Um, and that's the basis of a list comprehension. Now, unfortunately, C++ doesn't quite get there, but it does a pretty good job. Um, so this idea of the set builder or set intention, list comprehension is the way that most people encounter it in languages. Uh, you see it in Python, which is rather uh, nice and short, very, very similar um, kind of approach. The job here, what we see is that the emphasis is on the squares of x for x in the range. There's no sense of mechanics. There's no sense of, I am the programmer, and suddenly I have to juggle state. Uh, the point there is, is direct. Haskell um, wins this one um, with a somewhat briefer uh, approach. Um, but then there's the joy. There's something else about declarative approaches. Declarative thinking, in many different ways, allows you to deal with stuff like this. I want the squares, x taken from natural numbers, where x is greater than or equal to 1. Now, that's quite a big set, it turns out. It's, 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 not, it's not small. And it's just like, and at this point, uh, it's, oh, we need to manage that. No, we don't. There you go. Just leave off the right-hand side, and it just goes on forever. This is fantastic. Now, this disturbs a number of people because they're kind of looking and go, oh, no, this is infinite. We don't do that in computing. You know, I've got 16 gig on this laptop, but, you know, next year, maybe 32, but that's a bit bigger. People get scared of infinity. You know, it's like physicists and singularities. They don't like them. Um, but it turns out you can deal with infinity as long as you don't look at it all at once. You have to be really, really careful. Do not look into the abyss. Okay, just look at one item at a time. If you do that, you're good. Okay, it turns out the balance, the way that we think about it from a declarative point of view is uh, I'm not going to tell you how I'm going to do it. I'm going to tell you how I might do it. This is how I would like to do this. So it turns out lazy evaluation is very much at the heart of this. When we look at iterators, they are a reification. They're a, a way of making laziness explicit. But if we can wrap them up further, then, as we have here, this is the equivalent. Uh, notice I've kind of switched from doing vector. That will take a long time, it turns out. Um, what I've got here is an expression that describes how you get the squares of all the numbers. It doesn't get the squares of all the numbers. A declarative approach is a way of saying, uh, you know, one of the aspects of declarative thinking is, here's what it would look like if I were to do it. Are you doing it? No, I'm not. Okay. So this is the big cheat that, uh, that some functional programming does. It's how they do I.O. in a number of languages. Yeah? I'm not doing I.O., but what's that expression? I'm telling you how I would do I.O. if I were to do it. Yeah? But what's that? Oh, yeah, I'm not doing that. You want to do I.O.? Give it to the runtime system, but I'm pure. Okay? That's, that's basically monads in, in 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> so the point there is that it's, it's what if. Things actually happen when you make a commitment. This is how I would do it. Give me the first 100, OK? Now things happen. Yeah, things start getting allocated. CPUs start cycling and all the rest of it. And again, we can do exactly the same thing um, here. Or we, indeed, we don't even have to allocate space for this beyond what is needed to describe this. Uh, we can just shove that straight into a loop and walk through it. 
So we are describing what it is that we want. We are not describing, by the way, you're going to need a variable. You're going to need some intermediate storage. Now you're going to need to run up a loop and do all of these things. We know this stuff. We, we've done this stuff. We can let somebody else do that. So there is this kind of style of thinking that is um, particularly helpful, but is becoming more real from a C++ perspective. We see from that that there is something else going on here. Simple filters that can be arbitrarily chained are more easily reused and more robust than any, uh, almost any other kind of code. Um, the point here is composability. Um, the STL almost managed it, but not quite. Um, it managed a certain degree of functional elegance in its classic form, but composability is about being able to take the out of something and put it to the in of something else. And uh, pipelines, uh, data flow architectures, um, functions that actually return stuff that you can then put on the input of something else, uh, these are all part of composability. And unfortunately, sometimes we stop short of that. So that idea is quite an old one. Very few ideas are very new. This is Doug McElroy's original memo, 1964. Um, we should have some way of coupling programs like garden hoses, screwing in another segment when it becomes necessary to manage data in another way. And this is the way of I.O. also. This is the invention of the Unix pipe. It turns out it took six or seven years before somebody found the pipe symbol on the keyboard. Okay? But the idea was there. So what symbol should we use? Whenever people say, oh, yeah, just arguing over notation, just remember, six or seven years. You know? from, the time, from the time it took him to come up with this memo to the time Ken Thompson said, damn it, I'm going to use the pipe symbol, people had landed on the moon. Okay? <laughs> So, yeah, never worry about your project being too late. Yeah, there's always somebody slower than you. Okay, what about, what about ancient harvested wisdom? Okay, the book that everybody should read, and actually the anniversary edition's got some really nice stuff. But there's, um, uh, and I read the original, and then I read the anniversary edition. Uh, both are, uh, yeah, I, the anniversary edition's got some extra material there, some really great stuff. But there's a really good point that uh, Fred Brooks makes. It's a classic for a reason. Um, and here's part of the classic. Uh, representation is the essence of programming. Uh, show me your flow charts or your, you know, your control flow and conceal your tables, and I shall continue to be mystified. Show me your tables, and I won't usually need your flow charts. They'll be obvious. There's this classic idea of, if I can understand your data structures, if I can see your data structures, and your data structures are well expressed, clearly named, and their relationships are clear, then it becomes kind of obvious how the control will flow through them. That becomes a secondary detail. If, it, if that doesn't make sense, and you have a world of integers and strings, then perhaps I'm going to need an awful lot more work to go through your control flow. Okay? And uh, there is a tendency these days for people to uh, make a lot of stringly type systems, which uh, is, is particularly frustrating. Um, but these types, their names, uh, their concepts, their relationships, make it really, really clear. And let the data structure do as much work on your behalf as possible. Uh, and this applies to uh, a number of things, including, I'll talk a little bit about threading later. So, um, but obviously, not everything that is, so th the basic idea here is that data structures, and I'll focus on tables for a moment, are very powerful. Um, I think it's always quite humbling when somebody points this one out. Um, Excel is the world's most popular functional language. Um, so when you're sitting there going like, yeah, I got like cool functional C++, just remember those people who are crunching the numbers in your organization have been doing way more FP than you have, okay? <laughs> so um, every programming paradigm comes in different shapes and sizes. Um, what we find is that um, they, they, they all have their positive and negative uh, manifestations. So, um, let's have a look at uh, let's have a look at a very uh, a simple toy example to sort of look at just the, the, the tabular way of thinking, and then also another uh, declarative approach. Um, just to say that I I have an interest as well as photographing books. I do enjoy photographing books. They are so much easier than photographing people. Um, uh, I, I kind of enjoy language and words, and uh, I have this uh, Facebook page, Word Friday, uh, where every Friday, and that would be today, and I still haven't done it yet, um, I post an unusual word, the rest of the week I post other language and linguistic stuff. Um, but one of the words I managed to sneak in um, uh, a while back, biquinary coded decimal. 
Now, I know if somebody, somebody contacted me on Twitter and says, I, I often try and use your word Friday in a conversation over the weekend. Okay, it's like they set it up as a personal challenge. If you can just drop this into a conversation at some point, then, you know, credit to you. Yeah, I, I, I have not been able to find a domestic situation in which biquinary coded decimal makes any kind of sense, but I invite your thoughts on this. Um, okay, biquinary coded decimal, a system of representing numbers based on counting in fives. I have no idea how that happened. <laughs> um, with an additional indicator to show whether the count is in the first or the second half of the decimal range. So we're talking 0 to 4, 5 to 9, or 1 to 5, 6 to 10. Um, system is found in many abacus systems. Not the abacus systems you give you to your kids, which have 10 beads, uh, but proper abacus systems. They have 5, 2, 5, 2. It's also used in um, uh, the Colossus computer. There are actually a number of early computers uh, electrical and even a couple of electromechanical ones um, tended to use this before everybody worked out, you know what, binary is a lot easier. Yeah? Are you sure? Yes. No. Okay, we're done. That's it. Um, so perhaps one of the classic ones is the Roman numeral system. Now, there is a, there is, there is a, there's a lot of stories of, uh, and ideas about the origin of Roman numerals. And there's one that I want to be true, but I know is not, or most likely not, and that's the idea that it works. Uh, the Roman numerals work well across a marketplace where you have to um, uh, communicate uh, with your hands. And so one, two, three, that works nicely. Okay, that's five. Uh, that's ten. I've got, I'm going to give you 50 here, or 100. Okay? I want that to be true. I th it probably isn't, but in these... In these kind of like post-truth eras, maybe let, let's go for it. It is true. I've just told you a true fact. It might be a little alternative. But one of the classic ways, uh, one of the classic little coding carters people like to get involved in is um, convert a number into a Roman numeral. Okay? They normally bound themselves up to about, normally uh, the problem is bounded up to about 4,000, 1 to 4,000. Um, and here is one of those enterprise masterpieces. Um, let's, re let's refocus. I mean, yeah, the normal response you get when you point out to somebody, this feels strangely repetitive, um, uh, is it works. And it's like, well, <sighs> yeah, it's software. You can ultimately make anything work given enough time and enough effort. That's, not, that's, that's, that's nothing to brag about. Um, but yeah, this is all nice and enterprising. Um, but there's a more elegant solution uh, that we can do in terms of taking inverting the problem, separating it out. There is a bit of control flow here. Um, I leave it as an exercise for you. Um, you can actually do this with accumulate. You can turn it into reduce. Um, so you end up with no control state at all. But what I've done is I've isolated all the control state to the end. Um, and now the problem has actually um, reversed. And we can actually see that it's quite simple if you didn't know what this was doing to figure out what it was doing. Um, it is a uh, what we've done is we've structured it with the minimum of control flow. We're trying to get the data to do as much work as possible. So from the humblest beginnings of just looking at um, lookup tables and using more lookup structures, um, replacing explicit selections with an understanding of what are the relationships between the values and the consequences. Do these relate to actions or do they relate to further values? What you're doing is creating a very different mindset of programming. You're no longer shuffling bits around, which is sometimes what it feels like, even at the higher levels. But, of course, you know, you can take this problem even further, and there's a different way of solving the problem. I, I always used to consider the problem to be an arithmetic problem, um, but a friend of mine, uh, John Jacker, found a solution online, and uh, he came over to my house one day, and we kind of coded it up uh, in Ruby, and uh, uh, I think it was originally in F-sharp, coded it up in Ruby, then I promptly recoded it in Python, I prefer Python, and then I promptly recoded it in a number of different languages. C++ is such a pain in the backside for this. Come on, string handling people, we've got to get this sorted. Um, uh, so, uh, but it turns out that there is a very elegant way of solving this. I thought, you know what, I, th I reckon I could do this as a bash script. Um, and uh, there it is. So, uh, it turns out it's not an arithmetic problem at all. It's actually a symbolic uh, problem. What you do is you, the guys who decided biquinary was too much, let's go to binary, they did not stop soon enough. Unary. Unary is the fundamental counting system of the universe. Okay? One planet, two planet, three planets, four planets. How do you represent a thousand planets? With a thousand planets. It's that simple. 
okay? So, what have we got? If I give you five, then that's I, 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 I. Ten, uh, twice that. Okay, so what we do is we do a simple unary conversion. Uh, by the way, I make no claims for the efficiency of this, but damn, the elegance. Look at the elegance, people. Okay, and then you have this very simple reduction. Again, funnily enough, a different style, but a declarative form nonetheless. What I've done is I've defined the relationship. There's no whiles here. There's a kind of an idea of, again, this one is easy to explain. In fact, this is the easiest of all the ones I've just shown to explain to my kids because they don't have to know said. They don't have to know regexes but it can be explained, and there's a natural progression there. It turns out that human beings like sequences. Okay, we reason through sequences when we explicitly formulate our reasoning. That other thing that you do, intuition and all that stuff, that's not, you know, that's not sequential. The bit that you do afterwards when you try and make it sound as if you were thinking in a, uh, sequentially and reasonably is sequential. Um, okay, it turns out that we like sequences, which is why imperative programming is so popular, sequential, classic programming. But there are other kinds of sequence, and the idea of a sequential flow of other things other than control, the relationships of data, this goes within this, goes within this, and so on. These are also appealing and simple. Now, while we're on the subject of Romans, it did occur to me, given that, you know, there are guidelines, don't hard code numbers, I, I tweeted this the other day. It's already got quite a few retweets. Uh, first Roman programmer. Months seven, eight, nine, and ten don't have names. What should we call them? Second Roman programmer. Ah, just number them. First Roman programmer. Isn't it bad practice to hard code numbers? Second programmer. It's fine. They'll never change. Right. September, October, November, December it is then. If you've never thought about why the, num why the months have those names, this is why. Yeah? Somebody changed it. People will always change things. Okay, anyway, enough of that. Let's go back to the heart of um, FP. So there's another point here. Programs are executed by evaluating expressions in contrast with imperative programming where programs are composed of statements which change global state when executed. Just to clarify, when they're talking about global state here, they're not talking about global variables or a global scope. They are talking about a state that is accessible and visible to other parts of the program, potentially obtainable by other parts of the program. Uh, shareable state, if you like. Um, functional programming typically avoids using mutable state. Now, this matters in a number of cases. Uh, first of all, that whole reasoning thing. Um, this is your bottleneck in software development. Um, it, it turns out what you can understand here. And it turns out one of the things we're not very good at uh, is understanding um, threading. And uh, Bartosz Smolewski had this lovely, uh, lovely description of how to think about uh, you know, threaded programming in most systems. Shared memory is like a canvas where threads collaborate in painting images, except that they stand on the opposite sides of the canvas and use guns rather than brushes. Uh, he, okay, you know, he spent some time in America. Um, <laughs> uh, they only avoid killing each other uh, if they shout duck before opening fire. Uh, somewhere there's a good guy with a gun, but we don't know where. Um, if only we could find them. Now, this is completely the wrong way of approaching the problem, because this leads to a very very clear way of, of doing things. And I want to position all declarative programming and this kind of thinking in a particular space, because I want to emphasize the relationships between things. Um, we can draw up a very simple quadrant diagram. Um, our state is mutable or immutable, and it is either shared or not shared between threads. Okay, At any given point in time, we can say, yes, this is in one thread, or no, this is actually shared between two threads. Uh, and so the only places we need explicit synchronization, I want to say that there is synchronization going on, obviously, at the CPU level and potentially in libraries and through intermediate things like queues and so on. What I'm focusing on here is the stuff that's going to affect scalability and the stuff that's going to that you can get wrong. If, the, if I give you more control, you can screw up. Okay. If you don't believe me, I refer you to the British referendum. Okay. <laughs> so, um, what we understand here is it turns out that there are four quadrants. I've given you a choice of four places you can program. Four places. Okay. One of them is really bad. If you're not sure which one it is, it's 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 this one here, the synchronization quadrant. Okay. I'm going to adopt here. Red is the color of danger. That works in most most in most of nature, you know, it's the color of blood. This is what people spill when they try and solve deadlock problems, race conditions, and so on. 
Yeah, there is blood on the coat, okay? A red in the Far East is also the color of celebration, and that's for the consultants <laughs> who have to deal with this coat. That's the hard bit. Now, I always wonder, you know, look, three quarters of this stuff's really easy. Yeah? yeah? Doctor, doctor, every time I change state, it hurts. Well, stop changing state. I mean, it really is that simple. Doctor, doctor, every time I share state and try to change it, it hurts. You know, so don't, you can change it, but don't share it. You can share it, but don't change it. Okay, it's really simple. Yeah, if you're feeling particularly paranoid, don't share, don't change, okay? But, there's, but we, we are attracted to this, like moths to a flame. How do we get there? Why do we end up? Why is the, the imperative paradigm so dominant, evenly, even it's sort of in the, our basic thinking? Well, it turns out that this is relatively easily explained. Um, historically speaking, uh, we all programmed on the left-hand side. Because until you had threads, you weren't really sharing anything. But by, by default, you were unshared. And so it turns out you had a free choice. And it turns out that because of constraints, because of uh, assembly, because of whatever, it turns out that the top left was the more natural one. Uh, uh, but now most of these things, I'm not going to say they don't matter. There are environments in which they matter. But I was describing, and I had the experience, I described it to my older boy, but I actually had a, description, I had a chat with my younger, with my younger son. Um, uh, we were... I don't know, we were talking, yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you studying in science at the moment? Biology, Dad. Oh, okay, so we had a chat. What are you doing? Oh, we've yeah. done some stuff on the genome. Oh, okay. And uh, so we talked about that, and we talked about DNA and, and things like that. And I said, you know, when your brother said, you know, RNA is not a proper life form, all this kind of stuff, you know, viruses. So we had a chat about this stuff. And then he asked, you know, he asked me the question, how much stuff is in DNA? You know, how much, you know, I said, this is the plan for creating a human being. And I said, well, I once worked it out, and I said, it's around three gigabytes. And he said, that's not very much, is it? And it's like, if you told somebody that 20 years ago, at the height of the Human Genome Project, three gigabytes, oh my goodness. Wow, gigabytes. I didn't even know that was a prefix for byte. <laughs> you know? It's just like, wow. But now, it's just like three gigabytes. Yeah, OK, I've got, you know, my, my collection of cat pictures is bigger than that. So. <laughs> So the point here is this stuff is, 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 is utterly trivial. Um, so what we find is that our sense of what is small or what is large has changed. But we have discovered that we have enough slack in most systems to accommodate a very different model of thinking. Uh, so unfortunately, what happened is we took that kind of thinking, which was very grounded in state change, and we said things to people. We said, don't do the global variable thing. Don't do that. Don't do that. And everybody went, yeah, globals. Yeah, maximal state change, all the rest of it. And then you throw in threads. And if you don't know what you're doing already, you really won't know afterwards. In fact, the only thing you know you'll do is panic. Um, so we have this problem. The declarative mindset looks to take us away from this. It all, there are some other benefits, by the way. The ob classic observation. You know, I love it when people sort of say, yeah, we're putting locks in. Wow. Why, why, are, you why are you putting locks in? For safety. OK, so why are you doing threading? Ah, for performance. <laughs> you see, these two, these two are not comfortable together. OK, uh, uh, lock-based thinking is the anti-thread. OK, it's not composable. Uh, it doesn't scale. Now, that doesn't mean we can't describe systems. OK, um, so previous session, and one of the early sessions was on this. I've seen Sean uh, uh, present this approach. This is kind of where we want to go, people. Um, but also, I want to focus on the humble value. Uh, my favorite article title from last year from Communications of the ACM from Pat Helland. Mutability changes everything. So when we're talking about that, I'm going to go right back to a very, very simple class. I always roll out the date class. Um, because it's worth characterizing and then taking a bit further. Because there's some ideas here. If I take this from a, a, a slightly different perspective, I want to bring out two, uh, two or three little points here. So I'm going to default, um, yeah, I'm going to default a bunch of stuff, uh, copy assignment and uh, 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 sorry, uh, copy construction and uh, uh, copy assignment, and other things are defaulted as well. And this is how a lot of people might approach creating uh, a date class, because apparently it's really difficult to create simple date class abstractions, um, as most uh, libraries demonstrate. Um, and people have this knack of creating false symmetries. They kind of put in, they, oh, right, I'm going to get something, and then I'm going to set it. 
I'm going to get something, and I'm going to set it. And they, they think, oh, this is a beautiful balance. I brought balance to the force. It's like, no, 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 you don't have to have one and then the other. People often even automate this in their IDEs. Yeah, this whole idea of you can do the IDEs allow you to do the wrong thing faster. And it's just like, yeah, yeah I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, there's something I don't get right. Okay, now I can make it, I can do it, I can do it faster now. Yeah, it's, it's the wrong obsession. Um, so let's just get rid of that. Okay, the other thing to observe is often we unify, we often don't change things individually because there's a, a really challenging problem here. And this is, uh, and this is the, a, a, very, a, key, a very key and subtle point. Although this has the word public there, and there is the suggestion that the word private is somewhere here, although it has the word class there, in many cases, people do not focus on this as a system of meaning. There are valid dates and there are invalid dates. There are arrangements of year, month, and day that are not valid. The idea that I might want to arbitrarily just set a year or set a month randomly without any other relationship to the others. These are, there's an invariant that this thing has to respect. So at the very least, I should be setting them together. And so that gives us today. Now, um, it turns out that we are actually doing the same job as something that already exists. Um, it turns out that we don't need that because that job is already being done by the constructor. Uh, the validation is being done there. If it's nice and inlined, uh, or it's nice and uh, inlineable, uh, this becomes easier, and you get a lot of syntactic levity as well. Um, the, the whole notion here is just like, okay, let's just, just describe the thing as a system. It is a system of meaning. So now what I've got is dates are properly values. Okay, there is this idea of it represents a value. The only way of changing that value is by rebinding it via the assignment operator. Now, if we're so intent on this idea of talking about things having properties and we want to get away from imperative thinking, then I want to draw you to draw your attention to one thing here. People often use the word get as a prefix. It makes them feel kind of comfortable. Um, and th this kind of pops up in a lot of code. And I've asked people about this, and normally it's kind of like the, the responses my kids give me. Um, it's just like, well, he's doing it. I'm doing that because she's doing that. It's like, yeah, I'm sure we've got more compelling reasons to be able to do something. Just saying the other kids at school are doing it is not enough. Um, and then sometimes people say, well, it makes it clear that it's a, it's, it's a, you know, it's clear what it means, isn't it? You know, it, it, it's, is it? I just want to, okay, I said I was a bit of a word nerd. I have a copy of the Oxford English Dictionary um, on my laptop because physically printed out, they actually stopped physically printing it out because it's just ridiculous amounts of tree. Um, and it, as a dictionary, if you are interested in usage, how do I use this word, this dictionary is almost completely useless, okay? It sucks at this. If, on the other hand, you want to know what is the history of this word for the last thousand years, this is the dictionary, okay? And here is this word going back, and we see its cognate forms in, in, uh, in, in Swedish, uh, in Middle Dutch, in Old Frisian. You know, this is, you know, this is nerdgasm central. So, uh, but really what I want to draw your attention to is the fact that the scroll bar is proportionate. <laughs> and I want to draw your attention to the fact that on the left-hand side, there are four head entries. It turns out that when printed out, get covers about 30 pages, its definition. Oh yeah, that's a simple definition. It is one of the two longest definitions in the OED. The other one is, yes indeed, set. <laughs> they were destined to go together, weren't they? And people say, oh well, you know, set's like the opposite, you know, get and set, they're like opposites. No, the opposite of set is either reset or unset. It's not get, it really, it isn't. So let's, Let's also remember something else, that in default English usage, to get something is to change state. It is, it's an imperative, okay? When I get money from a cash machine, disappointingly, it has a side effect on my bank account. <laughs> okay, this is a big one. My, my favorite example is to get married. Big state change. <laughs> yeah, okay, the word get by default means change state. That's what its default meaning is. If you're trying to get people to think about the values, don't focus on the mechanics. 
It's not an imperative here. So let's switch, tidy up the naming here. OK, so now we're getting, that, this is all good. This is all fine. Um, we might want to say, well, sometimes I do want to qualify the year or the month or the day, but to do it uh, as a projection from an existing value, I want some convenience there. OK, well, there's already a style that people often adopt, a sort of builder-like style um, to do this. And you can just sort of reconstruct everything with year, or you can actually optimize out if it's actually the same year. You don't need to do revalidation. And you can continue this. So the idea is to think of your values like this as a series of relationships. So I can define a date, not, and you'll see that this actually scales up into other data flow approaches. What you're doing here is you're saying, well, here is today, and then I'm going to, with a, uh, a different month, I'm going to, maybe I'm going to move through the year. Um, but the idea is you define this with respect to this. You don't change this. You define this with respect to this. And that relationship is, um, is immutable. It is um, constant and invariant. OK, that's all very well. But a lot of people are very familiar with some of that. But sometimes they miss out that little idiom. Um, but what about containers? What about containers? Because obviously, passing around copies of things is quite expensive. And return value optimizations are not going to save you every time. Move optimizations are not going to save you every time. Um, if you take a million things and you add one to them, there will be a cost. Um, so there is this idea of like, how do I do this? And um, so I, I want to focus on objects. Um, here is a, a pile of books that are all about objects. Um, curiously, it turns out that psychotherapists, um, psychotherapists are utterly obsessed with. Actually, they're just utterly obsessed. Um, uh, my, my, mother's, my mother was a psychotherapist, and it hasn't affected me in the slightest. No, it explains everything. But they are, uh, yeah, object relations, shadow the object self. Yeah, it's just like internal objects revisited. Yeah, I've seen that code. Um, um, actually, what I'm interested in here is stack. This is a stack of books. So let's talk about the lab rat of computer science, OK? How far can we get with this one? And we're going to use that to demonstrate a number of points. I'm going to uh, characterize it. Uh, in terms of th uh, four operations, push, pop, depth, and top, uh, depth being the size. And I'm just going to uh, focus in it like that. And then um, we'll throw in a default construct because I want to be able to talk about it. Uh, and we're going to make it a pure pop um, in that sense, just like the STL. In other words, it doesn't uh, return anything as a side effect. So we have this question. If we are pursuing a system of meaning, how do we understand what this is supposed to do? And there is a very useful idea. The earliest I've been able to date the contract metaphor is Butler Lamson's paper in the early 80s, 1983, Hints for Computer System Design. Um, an interface is a contract to deliver a certain amount of service. Um, clients of the interface depend on the contract, which is usually documented in, in the interface specification. I think that's wonderful and sweet um, and shows a certain optimism that perhaps people had at the early 80s. It is usually documented. No, is occasionally documented. <laughs> Yeah, usually suggests a frequency that is, well, I've not experienced it. Um, so, uh, but really, a lot of people tend to focus, when they talk about contracts, they tend to focus on um, Bertram Meyer's uh, uh, exposition of this in uh, object-oriented software construction. Um, and the Eiffel language, which has this kind of concept of pre- and post-conditions integrated into its core. And I was very, very strongly influenced by this uh, when I read this book, it was only years later I discovered all of the uh, deficiencies in both his uh, way of thinking about objects um, and, indeed, uh, in the way that he frames um, uh, contracts through pre- and post-conditions. So we can have a go at this. When you construct it, post-condition, the depth is zero. Okay. Push. Okay, well, let's make a note of the depth. Uh, the post-condition, when you after a push, is that the depth is whatever it was plus one, the old depth plus one, and the top is the new top. And this seems OK. Um, pop, precondition, the depth is greater than zero. The postcondition, hmm. <laughs> well, at this point, it becomes obvious that there is something missing from our story. The depth is the old depth minus one. Can you tell me no more about it? No. Can you tell me if it's empty? Well, it depends. I could, but the expression actually becomes more complex than the implementation. Could you tell me what the top is? No, I couldn't. Not without adding an awful lot of extra. So 
this is the truth, but it is very, very partial. This is one of the things that people don't understand about pre and post conditions, is they are a very, very weak form of specification when it comes to actual languages. Um, depth. <laughs> this is a truism. What can you tell me about the depth? Uh, well, it'll be zero or more. Well, I could tell that from size t. <laughs> OK. Can you tell me nothing else about it? No. Uh, tell me what platform are you running on? I'm running on a 64-bit platform. Well, it's one of two to the 64 values. Gee, thanks. <laughs> You've really narrowed it down. That was a contract worth having. Um, top, precondition, the depth is greater than zero. Can you tell me anything else? Absolutely nothing. Wow, this is really limited. I mean, nothing up there is false. And if you actually switch, if you look at the, um, uh, the contracts proposal for C++ 20, you don't even get this much. You get even less. Depth is zero. You get depth is greater than zero. Yeah, that's all good. And then down here, we start looking at, well, I don't even get to talk. Well, there's, it, what you get is, is, I think, the word trivial. Okay? I don't want to be too dismissive of it, but it's, it's really edge cases. It just doesn't get out what I understand as a stack. So um, although this is declarative, it doesn't seem to have taken us down the right road. Perhaps there's a different way of thinking about stacks. Well, I offer you another red and white book um, from the uh, similar era, or well, actually earlier, uh, early 1980s, um, CSP. I'm not going to talk about um, Tony Hall's uh, communicating sequential processes from the point of view of concurrency. I'm going to talk about it from the point of view of uh, thinking about um, behaviors. And um, the way he reasoned, I, I've sort of adapted the notation a little, Let's look at what you've got as a stack. What I'm interested in is, in, if I want to talk about it, what, what kind of vocabulary does it have? What is, what is its alphabet? Uh, what kind of noises can it make? And I'm going to sort of objectify it slightly and say, well, you can do a push, a pop, a depth, and a top. The really interesting bit is when you say, and what conversations can I have with it? Give me a trace. Give me a list, or give me rather a set, of all the possible interactions I could ever have that are legal with a stack. Well, the first one, the empty trace, is uh, you can create it and then ignore it, which is a bit harsh, but I've seen code that does that. You, know? uh, you can create it and push on it. You can create it and ask it its depth. You can create it and push and then pop. You can create it and push and then ask for the top. You'll see that there are no sequences, there are no valid sequences of one or two that um, have pop as the first one or top as the first one. So what you do is you are enumerating all of the possible sequences. As you may guess, there's a lot of detail hidden in the dot, dot, dot at the end. <laughs> if you have a junior programmer uh, or an intern, you know, and you're not sure what to do with them, get them to write this out, okay? <laughs> keep, keep them busy for a while. Um, don't tell them about state charts, because that makes it a lot easier for them. Uh, it turns out that this generates um, uh, that model. And it gives us a, a, an easy way of looking at it. It makes certain things explicit. Um, visual notations have fallen out of favor recently, which I think is a shame, because um, some of them can be wonderfully precise. And the Harel state chart notation is exactly this. And what we're looking at here is very much a uh, it's a, it's a visualized declarative form. In fact, historically, um, David Harrell actually created a calculus notation for this and then drew these diagrams by the side, but he noticed that everybody was ignoring the calculus and looking at the diagrams. So eventually he kind of dropped the notation uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and went for this. Um, so we can actually discuss this much more reasonably at that level. So this, this is quite good. Okay, so. Where does that take us? Well, that takes us to uh, the question of what are we going to do if we do actually um, try and do a top uh, or a pop in the empty state. Um, we could leave it as undefined behavior, um, which is unnecessarily exciting for this example. Um, so I'm going to uh, recognize that when it comes to uh, this question of what do you do when things go bad, um, and this is a key observation. Uh, Tolstoy, it turns out, was actually a programmer. Um, if you just think about the title War and Peace, for example, I mean, is that not about software and development? Just <laughs> War and Peace, you have everything there. And, and in the opening lines of Anna Karenina, um, uh, he talks about exceptions and failures. Um, he talks about this idea, or to be precise, he talks about failures in the happy day scenario versus the rainy day scenario of code. 
because when things work, they just work. And there is one way in which they work. But when they go wrong, there are so many exciting different ways, so many dysfunctionalities, just like families. Um, so I'm going to choose to say that in this case, I'm going to say you, uh, we're going to throw when we call top on an empty or pop on an empty. And um, that's going to be my mapping here. Now, let's go back to this guy. This is, uh, OK, we started on this from a point of view of what do we do with immutable uh, objects. And I wanted to sort of explore some of the other declarative thinking around state change. But I want to say, no, we can have a stack that is um, itself immutable uh, and, uh, and moderately efficient. Um, so I'm just going, and we can see that the implementation is trivial. You can do this, uh, you know, if I say you can do it as a vector, you can do it as a forward list. And there's lots of possibilities. But I'm not interested in these. I'm interested in what happens when I make it immutable. In other words, every member function is now const. And push and pop return a stack. In other words, in fact, I'm going to change the name slightly. Um, push and pop are imperatives. OK, they, they suggest state change. But also, in a code base where you do have state change, it's really unnecessarily uh, confusing to have things that are named the same and tell people, oh, yeah, this is a non-modifying push. Give it a different name. Don't give it a special, oh, it's the one that's const. No, give it a different name so it's greppable. Yeah? Grep for non-modifying, no, that's not, that's not going to work. Okay? So in other words, I'm going to describe it as a relationship. This is what happens once you pushed, and this is, the, uh, this is this, popped. In fact, you could, using the with terminology earlier on, um, look at this as pushed is with top, and popped is without top. Yeah? It's, uh, what you're doing is you're saying, given this, project it with this additional transformation, and have a look at it from that point of view. So we've got that. Now, that would be expensive if we were copying around a vector. So there is a question here of implementation. Um, the way we're going to approach this, there are far better sessions and far better articles on dealing with uh, persistent data structures, structures that um, give you the illusion that things are going on and uh, uh, that are remaining immutable when actually they're not. But if we take a very simple example, if we take the, uh, the humble array, we start off like that, we start off like that. If I can guarantee that none of the elements changes, then it's OK to alias the representation. You know, it's trivial because apart from taking apart from looking at non-salient features such as the address of something there is nothing that i as a user can do with a properly const object uh, that will demonstrate that hey guess what we're sharing the representation uh, we can't make that perfectly um, but every now and then i get people sort of saying well yeah but you can't make this guarantee perfectly it's just like no this is c++ i can use memset there is no guarantee in the face of a void pointer and memset OK, you're going to have to give up the illusion that is the type system. Whatever you do, I can ultimately bring it crashing down to bits and bytes. So, you know, there has to be some tolerance. I've got, I've got the compiler on my side for most of this. Uh, OK, so we've got that. So if I do a push, if I say that C is A popped, then that works nicely. The aliasing still works. Um, not going to work out so well for pushed. OK, so we change to a link representation. Same story holds. And we are able to maintain this illusion. Um, and in fact, this can tree off into memory rather, rather beautifully. Uh, we can share representation. Um, and so now we maintain the illusion that actually I am giving you a new stack. Okay? So all of software is ultimately smoke, mirrors, and maintaining uh, illusions. And that's what we're doing here. Um, there's nothing new in this. Uh, let me take you back to the late 1950s. Uh, and uh, that's my copy of the Lisp programmer's manual point that I, a number of years ago, I, uh, I, I wrote this in uh, the uh, uh, CUJ article, uh, number 15, Christ, it's that long. Um, I still have a deep fondness for the list model. It is simple, elegant, and something with which all developers should have an infatuation at least once in their programming life. Uh, this is also an important lesson. I told you earlier on, do not hard code numbers. If you are ever in the middle of, if you are ever tempted to do this when you are writing a blog series, do not number the parts. Okay? Do not do this. I had loads of editors tell me, do not do this, and they would change all of my part one, part two articles and give them unique names. Finally, once I got my way, it was with this one. There never was a part two. <laughs> there is still a guy that works for, uh, that, uh, from, uh, works for John. Uh, John Lakos, who asked me a few years ago, he came up to me. You know, I thought this was 
my dark past forgotten. He comes up to me. It's nearly a decade on. He says, Kevin, where's part two? What? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, when I say don't hard-code numbers, what I mean is don't hard-code numbers. Um, okay, so I, I had a data structure in that which I call Lisped, which I was very pleased with as a name. Um, but I'm just going to uh, uh, make this as part of a, uh, the uh, stack, and we can see there's our stack. It's got a link, and there's all kinds of stuff going on there. And we've got things work, create new links, and so on. It, it all does what it's supposed to, and the, it does what it's supposed to. We'll come back to how I know it does what it's supposed to in a bit. But there is an interesting question here. The interesting question concerns the representation. It turns out that when we, when we say, you know, there's a quote earlier on about Haskell and the idea that some languages help us with some things and they hinder us in others. If you're working in C++, pursuing an idea of shared representation works really well up to a point. The idea of using constants works really well up to a point. There's a lot of stuff that really works well, but there are certain weaknesses. What is the weakness in this code as it stands? Assume that I have shown you all the rest of all the code. Huh? No, no, that's not a weakness. Good heavens. I, did, you, did you see the Roman numeral solution I showed you earlier? <laughs> yeah? Well, no, there's no such thing as slow unless you have a context. Okay? You can never say something is always slow with respect to something or fast with respect to something else. Yeah? So um, that, that's not its problem. I haven't given you a context against which you can evaluate that. What might be considered the problem here, though? No, no, it's not. It's a linked list. You've used linked lists before? Yeah, good. Yeah, it actually, the point here is that you are paying one allocation for one allocation. Yeah? Yeah, space-wise, it's actually cheaper than some things. So yeah, there's, no, there's, no, there's, no other, there's no other stuff going on here. You're not, you're not having to, you know, I haven't, I haven't optimized it for allocators or anything like that. That's fine. OK, let's talk about memory. Let's talk about, ah, uh, yeah. Let's talk about memory. <laughs> so Tolstoy was not the first programmer. In fact, neither was Shakespeare, but Shakespeare was one of the earlier, most prolific programmers that we know of. Um, but the absence of computers in the late 16th and early um, 17th century was a little bit of an obstacle. It proved to be challenging for him. So he had to encode, um, he had to encode everything in play form. Okay? Uh, he was a very big fan of the actor model of computation. Um, <laughs> So he got in there centuries ahead of everybody else. Uh, and he, so if you look at his plays as a sort of parables of, of software challenges and, the, uh, and questions, then we find that um, uh, the tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, is in fact a, it's a story about memory management. You, know, you take its most famous line, to be or not to be, that is the question. OK, I've got an object. Is it still there? Is it valid? Yeah, do we want it? Are we going to get rid of it? What? what? Okay, this, this is really, Hamlet is really worried about this. Ophelia, she has a very particular approach. She's kind of classic C++ old school. Okay, it's like, tis in my memory locked. And you yourself shall keep the key of it. God damn it, you knew and delete it, Hamlet. <laughs> yeah, but Hamlet's got other ideas. And he's just like, whoa, what about garbage collection, man? Yay, from the table of my memory, I'll wipe away all trivial phone records. So Hamlet's advocating a garbage collected approach. Okay, so you see, this, this is the tension at the heart of the play. Yeah, people don't understand this play. Yeah, and I'm here to help you. <laughs> now we have a little bit of a problem um, in C++ because, um, uh, as Bjarne observes, his FAQ. Garbage collection is not is optional in uh, C++. That is, a garbage collector is not a compulsory part of an implementation. Um, to say this makes it almost entirely useless as a feature mm, is not much, of an, uh, not much of an overstatement. You get your GC if your point of safety is at strict. If it's a preferred, you get a little bit of something. If it's a relaxed, well, it's just relaxed. It just leaks. The thing is, my code was written. My code was written assuming garbage collection. 
So actually, it works perfectly with no leaks in a garbage collected environment. How do you write that portably? You, you can't. In other words, this is an almost entirely useless feature from the point of view of people writing um, portable code. Yeah? I almost wish it didn't have it, because it kind of gives people false promise. Hey, come this way. We've got garbage collection. And then they get you in the door sometimes. Yeah? Oh, god damn. It's like a phishing scam. So it's a case of, like, I can't write this reliably like that. It's just, ah, that's kind of annoying. So yeah. Um, this is, this is frustrating. So we're going to have to do it Ophelia's way. Yeah, if you wanted inefficiency, I've now given you, give, now you've got inefficiency. Yeah, now we're, gonna, now we're actually going to do reference counting and all the rest of it. Um, but there is a problem here as well when it comes to simplicity. And this is the problem. C++ sort of trips up in places we don't expect it to when we are trying to sort of say, oh, I've got these beautiful, elegant data structures and so on. It's like, ah, oh, the memory management is always a pain in the backside. There's always a gotcha somewhere. Um, and um, what I've got here is I'm going to do the squares thing, and I'm going to just generate a lot of squares. And I've got absolutely no problem doing that whatsoever. Everything works beautifully until the destructor. It turns out on destruction, deletion of the links is recursive through each link. Recursive, that means that you will the destructors will fill up the stack. And depends on what platform you're on, but on, my, on that laptop using GCC, it's just over 5,000, and then <laughs> blows up. It's not that this is not a The thing is that I know when talking to a C++ crowd, everyone's thinking, oh, I can solve that problem. The problem is you have to solve that problem. It should not be a problem that needs to be solved. In other words, doing simple stuff should not be this hard. It turns out there are lots of ways to solve this problem. But just leaving the code as it is is not one of them. They will all require explicit programmer intervention, which is frustrating because there's an awful lot here that's, that's quite valuable. OK, so how do I know this stuff's working? I'm going to close today by talking a little bit about testing. And I want to bring the declarative mindset to testing because we have uh, a sort of a sort of a, a challenge when it comes to thinking about what it is that we want from tests. In, for many people, there is the sense when you say, you know, why are you testing your code? Well, no, let me, let me get, roll back. Are you testing your code? That's the first question. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and be, be careful that you're having the same conversation with somebody, because I've had the conversation where somebody says, yeah, I compile it. <laughs> it's like, that's not the same thing. Yeah. Um, so there's this idea. So, it turns out that testing has come into fashion, um, and you know, there's a but there's a lovely piece um, from Todd Golding in uh, Better Software Magazine a number of years ago. He said, "I'm using X unit, generic term for uh, various unit testing frameworks. I was using mock objects. So why did my test seem more like necessary baggage instead of this glorious enabling approach?" And I decided to look more closely at what was inspiring all the unit testing euphoria. As I dug deeper, I found some major flaws that have been fundamentally undermining my approach to unit testing. First realization that jumped out at me was my view of testing was simply too flat. I looked at unit testing landscape and saw tools and technologies. Often we look at things and go, oh, frameworks. What framework are you using? It's the fact that I historically always used to teach C++ unit testing starting from assert and then building up from that to demonstrate that as long as you have a simple way of saying this is true and this is not, then that is your, that's your ground level. All a framework will do is extend your reach and your convenience, but it will not change the possibility of the truth that you're able to reveal um, uh, when we look at the functional aspect. So the program in me made unit testing more about applying and exercising frameworks. You know, I'd reduced my concept of unit testing to the mechanics. Again, that term, mechanics. In general, my mindset had me thinking far too narrowly about what it meant to write good unit tests. And it's good unit tests that I want to emphasize. Good unit tests, fortunately, has a, a lovely abbreviation that works very well, um, particularly, uh, particularly in Germany. Das ist gut, yeah. Um, yeah so, uh, you, know, you know, tell me about your unit, unit tests. They're good. Yeah, it's like, cool, great, fantastic. So um, actually, the guts term was properly coined by Alistair Coburn. Uh, when he's saying, you know, very many people say TDD, test-driven development, when they really mean I have good unit tests. I have guts. And he talked about the modern programming professional having guts. His interest here was 
Test-driven development is a way of doing something, but what is the thing you get at the end of it? Or what is the thing you can get? Or put another way is, what is the thing that you want to end up with no matter what way you took? Yeah, th this is, there's journey versus destination. And there is this idea um, that sometimes people use the term TDD, and Ron Jeffries, he was one of the original um, uh, extreme programming crowd, um, because there's a lack of a catchword, people often use the term TDD, where they should really be talking about good unit tests. Now, there's lots of things that could qualify, but in the context of this talk is, I am interested in the communication of intent. I want to make testing more declarative. Quite literally, I want to make it more of a data structure. And the way a lot of people will go about testing the stack uh, class is to have a function called test stack. Uh, that doesn't really tell us much. How much does that communicate? It communicates that we are testing the stack. Right, that doesn't tell us very much at all. OK, we might refine our approach a bit and say, well, I'm going to test the stack constructor. I'm going to test the, st the stack pushed operation, the stack popped operation, the depth in the top. Well, here we're getting somewhere. But we can certainly improve on this naming. Um, let's actually structure things. We nest things and group things. Stack tests, we can get rid of the noise word test. Again, I'm very keen on getting rid of certain noise words that we, we have. I don't, want, I don't need my tests to have the word test plastered all over them. Normally it's very obvious from the context. And if it's not, then you're doing something wrong. Um, so what we've got, stack test, constructor, pushed, popped, depth, top. Now, if you look at this, this is a one-for-one -one mapping of all the member functions in the class. This approach to testing is obvious, it's intuitive, it's very common, and it's also completely wrong. I mean, it could not be more wrong. The only thing that is only slightly more wrong is if I name them test one, test two, test three, test four, test five. And yes, I have seen that. Yeah? The only thing you, the point is a test is an act of communication. You want to give meaning to your code. You don't simply want to say it works. The challenge is not to show that something works, it's to show what it means. When somebody says it works, yeah, but what are you expecting? That's the, that's the, it turns out that's the harder question. It's like, yeah, it's green, but what does that mean? It means that whatever it was doing, it's still doing. Great. So when it turned, was it the, doing the right thing? We have no idea. But it's still doing it. And now it's red. And it's no longer doing it. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? We have no idea. Yeah? That's a limited form of communication. What the whole point of this kind of thinking, this approach, is to say, it's, what is it supposed to do? What do we believe it's supposed to do? Let's, let's advertise that. Let's not hide it. That's the wrong kind of information hiding. OK, so let's talk about it. A new stack is empty. Yeah. There's no kind of question of, Kevlin, what do you mean by that? Yeah? Here, you're testing the constructor. What does that mean? It also, when I said this is completely wrong, it also turns out to be surprisingly impossible. How do you test a constructor? What is it that you're going to test about it? You're going to test the state of the object after you've constructed it. Oh, that means calling depth. Oh, so you're testing the constructor and the depth operation. So that should be called constructor and depth. And constructor and pushed and top and depth and construct. These are very poor names. We actually have ways of talking about this. A new stack is empty. An empty stack throws when queried for its top item. An empty stack acquires depth by retaining a push. In other words, this is a description of what this does. These are propositional statements. Okay? These, these are declarations that have truth value. Yeah? And truth value is, in this case, expressed through green, or uh, uh, falsehood is expressed through red. So. I'm going to take a small change there. I'm also going to adopt some terminology from the BDD community. So I say, yeah, let's call it a spec. You know, just, uh, instead of just thinking about that, think of it as a specification. One of the reasons I found this kind of language shift is helpful sometimes is for many people, they have existing ideas of what they think of as testing that are quite different. And so sometimes the way to get people to do something is to say, oh, it's nothing like that at all. Oh, these are not tests. This is just a specification. We're using examples to illustrate. Just describe what you're expecting to happen. Now, this kind of thinking um, led me a number of years ago to come up uh, uh, with an approach where I wanted to really think of a much more complete approach because most C++ testing frameworks I've ever seen were very function-oriented or inappropriately class-oriented. And I wanted a very different approach. I wanted to say, I want to focus on structure. I want nesting. I want, I want to have this language of propositions. I don't want to have people having to worry about identifier naming conventions and so on. 
Um, and this, uh, I dreamt this up. It was just a prototype framework uh, I gave a few, a few talks on a few years ago. Um, uh, it was uh, called Heathrow because Heathrow Airport is the airport where I had the idea. Or to be precise, it was on the approach path to Heathrow and then driving home from Heathrow that I worked out all of the details. Uh, Shakespeare could do it in plays. It turns out you can do some great programming in the car and on the approach path. Um, so uh, these basic ideas here, um, and um, Phil Nash saw, saw me do one of the talks, and that's what triggered Catch, is that idea of a very strongly intentional form. The idea is that you're not focused on test one, test two, you're not focused on the mechanics of this, you're focused on the relationships and being able to express yourself as clearly as possible without the constraints of identifier naming. The new stack is empty, an empty stack throws when query for its top item, and so on. Um, but actually what I was trying to do at the time was pre-C++11, or rather pre-C++11 adoption. What I was actually trying to do was something that I'd done in JavaScript. And I'm, I'm often very rude about JavaScript. There are reasons. There are very good reasons I'm rude about JavaScript. But the fact that in JavaScript, I was able to come up with a few lines and a really simple testing framework that took advantage of um, an object, a lookup, um, and just allowed me to have a simple ad hoc structure that had strong intention. And I couldn't do that easily in C++. really frustrated me. However, um, thanks to. Um, uh, uh, thanks to C++11, I can now do that trivially. Um, so therefore, I get to realize that this goal is I don't want to think of my tests as functions. I don't want to think of them like that. I want to th my tests are a data structure. Okay? What I want from a piece of code can be defined as a data structure. And you can take it deeper, but this is a fairly flat, uh, a simple flat one. Um, I've got a specification uh, stack spec. A new stack is empty code that does that, an empty stack throws one query for its top item, and so on. So you can see that the names are the uh, first and foremost thing. When a test passes, then that is, uh, that is a truth about the code that you have got. Um, it's a contingent truth. I mean, you can still get the test wrong. Um, uh, but it is, uh, it's a description of what we're expecting. And when it fails, you now know what it is that is not true. Um, it turns out you can you know, sort of describe the whole of that stack quite, quite, uh, quite easily. And the implementation still actually fits on a slide, which I'm always quite pleased with if I can get, uh, get that uh, done. We can also take this further. The idea of looking at, the, looking at things from this point of view is to get people thinking, oh, it's that easy. I could write tests for anything. What if I'm dealing with a pure function? What if I want to use more data? In the previous example, I was using single exemplars. Okay, I've got a stack, and I'm, in each case, I've got one example. But if I want to deal with a leap year, uh, then clearly I need to have a, perhaps a few values that I care about. So um, leap year, I think, is Shaltia. Is that correct? And, and, yeah. yeah. Um, and just out of interest, uh, you're a smart crowd. When is a year a leap year in the Gregorian calendar? I'm going to assume it's a proleptic Gregorian calendar. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. It just means you don't have to worry about crazy stuff. Yes, correct. Yes, well done. Um, that's why humans can't remember it. That's why I use it as a training example, because it's just like, you know, humans struggle with, you know, uh, humans struggle with rules, and then humans struggle with exceptions to rules, and if you throw an exception to one of the exceptions, that's that stack overflow, and it turns out is two in that case. Okay, humans can't, uh, you know, I struggle, if I, if, I, if I go to North America, I always struggle when I drive. It's just like, oh, you can turn right on a red. OK, that's one exception to the rule. Oh, except on a Tuesday when there's a full moon. You know, uh, you know it's just like, boom, can't do it, can't do it. You know, so uh, the point here is that I think it's an interesting example because it's not to do with the implementation. The challenge here is to demonstrate to the reader what's going on, to talk to the reader. I don't care about test is leap year. I want to communicate. What do we mean by leap year? And let me give you some examples. I want that to be as clear as possible. I don't want to have loads of procedural code doing that. So what I've got here, again, simple specification structure. Years not divisible by four are not leap years. Years divisible by four but not by 100 are leap years. Divisible by 100 but not by 400 are not leap years. And divisible by 400 are leap years. Oh, Kevin, do you have any examples of that? Well, absolutely, yes. Look, the value is 2017, 19, 1999, 1998, uh, eight, and one. They all result in false. So you end up with this whole idea of thinking of your test approach much more richly uh, and much more largely in this sense. And again, this is actually even less code than before. It's to the point where 
you can feel free potentially to create ad hoc frameworks that illustrate what you're doing here is, don't think of it as a framework. In fact, perhaps I shouldn't be using that term at all. What you're doing is you're creating a data structure that describes something. And that is the very bread and butter of most programming. So when people say, oh yeah, but we've already got a testing framework. That's nice. But are you describing what you're doing well? Is that, is that are you communicating the intent? If I asked you to write a class for something in your system, or rather, I want a new behavior, you say, well, we don't have that behavior. We're just going to have to use vector and string everywhere. It's just like, no, you can do better than that. Create your own abstractions. So there's this whole idea that tests are first-class data structures when you look at it from that point of view. And then you can do you know, simple implementations, or you can be crazy. Your colleagues will not thank you for this implementation, but they will thank you for the fact that you put the tests in there. Because ultimately, what we're looking at here and why, in a non-declarative language like C++, and indeed many mainstream languages, we still have the challenge of meaning as being a quest, but we can always do something to be more intentional. And by looking at things from a declarative point of view, there is this idea of framing things both in classic declarative uh, perspective, the idea of the data structure is doing the work, the data de structure describes the relationships that are the most important. Sometimes it can be very sophisticated. You can be setting up pipelines and computations. In other cases, it can be just as simple as using a lookup table. Um, sometimes it's shifting language or mode of description. In other ways, it's re in other cases, it's rethinking um, how you talk about your values. Um, and I think ultimately, the, all this is driven by the advice of uh, the author Elmore Leonard, trying to leave out the part that readers tend to skip. I find this is very useful for code and for documentation. And on that, I think we have a couple of minutes for questions, but. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your time. I hope that's been useful or inspiring. I hope you haven't had to sleep. You know, uh, that's later. Any questions? Go. Oh. I don't think that qualifies as a question. I think that's actually an action. That's an imperative. It has a huge, great side effect in the room. But thank you. Questions, thoughts? Random desires for coffee. Okay, we're going to go with random desires for coffee and later beer. Thank you very much.